Part One. You will hear a lecture on deep sea exploration. First, in the exam, you will have twenty seconds to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good evening. My talk this evening will cover three main themes. First, I'll outline a timeline of how deep sea exploration vessels developed. Secondly, I'll describe the most recent of these, the deep sea Challenger, and finally, I'll look at some of the benefits of this deep sea research. Okay. To start with, let's look at how underwater exploration vehicles have developed over the years. The first manned deep sea exploration vessel was invented in the 1920s. It was called a bathysphere, better known as a diving bell. It was basically a round metal structure with windows with just enough room for two men to sit in, and it was lowered into the ocean on a cable. The first descent in the diving bell. Took place in 1930, and in 1934 it went down to a depth of nearly a thousand meters, which was impressive for the time. The problem with the diving bell was that it had no power of its own, and there wasn't much room for the researchers to move around. So the next development after the diving bell was the bathyscaphe, a small manned submarine invented in the 1940s. The difference between the two was that the bathyscaphe had its own power source, which allowed the scientists to investigate in the depths of the ocean more freely. A bathyscaphe called the Trieste reached a record depth of ten thousand meters in 1960. Since then, a new record has been set by James Cameron, who descended to a depth of eleven thousand meters for the first time in 2012. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. So let's move on now to look at the submarine that took James Cameron so far down into the ocean. If you look at the drawing of the Challenger, you can see the pilot's chamber at the very bottom of the submarine. It's a very small section where the pilot sits and controls the sub and all the equipment on it. Now let's have a look at how the submarine is powered. Going up from the pilot's chamber, in the middle of the sub, on the right-hand side of the drawing, you can see a whole section covered in batteries. They provide the power source that takes the sub all the way to the bottom of the ocean and back up to the surface again. Next to that, there's another important part of the sub.、Um, you probably realise that there's no light at the bottom of the ocean, so the sub needs to take its own. If you look at the back of the sub, in the middle. Just next to the batteries, you can see the panel of lights. They provide the light for filming and taking samples from the seabed. And one more part of the sub, which is important for navigation and to stop it spinning out of control, is the large fin at the back. You can see it at the back of the sub at the top of the drawing. Okay. To conclude my talk, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. First. What is the purpose of this deep sea exploration? And second, is it worth the expense? I think one of the justifications for spending so much money on this kind of research is that it allows scientists to understand more about the surface of the Earth. For example, how it was formed and how it behaves. This could have important consequences for predicting earthquakes and saving lives through early warning systems. Another reason this type of research is considered valuable is that by exploring unknown parts of the ocean, 
we increase our knowledge of the availability of minerals for industry. And obviously, this could lead to huge commercial advantages. So, the answer is yes. In the long run, this kind of exploration can benefit both the ordinary population and industry. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a radio program on the process of making beer. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hello and welcome to Gourmet Evening. And this week we're looking at the world's popular beverage, a great favourite today, beer. And in the studio to tell us all about it is Clark Maxwell. Beer is one of my personal favourite beverages. And I've got a number of facts, tips and trivia about beer to share with you. So, who invented beer and when? What is beer made of? Actually, historians are not entirely sure when beer was invented, but they guess that beer was created accidentally by early nomadic tribes roughly 10,000 years ago. The four primary ingredients are malt, hops, yeast and water. Malt, which gives the beer a sweet taste, is made from barley soaked in water until its husks open and sprout. The sprouts are then dried and crushed. The small flowers of the hops vine are added partly because they taste bitter, helping balance the sweetness of the malt. Hops prevent the growth of bacteria that can spoil beer. Yeast is responsible for fermentation, which creates the alcohol and carbonation. Beer makers sometimes use additives or substitutes for malt or hops. Substitutes such as corn or rice can make a beer lighter or cheaper to produce. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Adding fruit gives beer a fruity taste. Beer is not high in alcohol, as we know. The lowest type, light beer, contains no more than 2% alcohol, and the highest may reach 6%. Other drinks, such as wine, are more alcoholic. Wine contains 8 to 20% alcohol. But that is not to say drinking beer is no danger at all. Like all alcoholic beverages, beer can make it difficult to drive and think clearly. Excessive drinking can also lead to liver damage, high blood pressure, stomach ulcers and other health problems. However, beer also helps prevent some health problems when consumed in moderation. Beer contains a moderate number of vitamins and minerals. Studies have shown that small amounts of alcohol can reduce the risk of heart disease. Beer also contains selenium, a mineral that promotes bone growth and helps reduce the risk of osteoporosis. I suppose many of you think beer can give you a beer belly, but you are mistaken. Genes determine how fat is deposited. No food or drink can create fat deposits in specific areas of the body. As with all foods, the more calories you consume, the more likely they are to be stored as fat and cause weight gain. 
Beer contains no fat and averages 150 calories per serving. Well, one more thing. Pay attention to the storage and containers of beer. They will affect its taste. It's a mistake that the taste of beer improves with age, like that of some wines. Beer is a food product that will eventually become stale. It should be stored in a cool, dark location before consumption. And the color of a bottle can influence the flavor. Brown bottles block out light that reacts with the hops, which could damage the flavor. Green or clear bottles provide little or no protection from light damage. Do you know which country drinks the most beer? Although Britain is even on the list of big consumers, actually the Czech Republic consumes the most beer at 156 liters per person per year, followed by Ireland and Germany. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a woman called Phoebe, who is training to be a teacher, talking to her tutor called Tony about research she has done in a school. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. So, how did you get on with your school-based research, Phoebe? Well, it was exhausting, but really valuable. Good. What was the specific focus you chose? My title is Attitudes Towards Study Among 11 to 12-year-old Pupils. Right, and what made you choose that focus? Well, <laughs> that's a bit difficult. Lots of my classmates decided on their focus really early on, mainly on the basis of what they thought would help in their future career, you know, in their first year's teaching. So that's what helped you decide? Actually, it was that I came across a book written by experienced teachers on student attitudes, and that motivated me to go for the topic. OK. So what were your research questions or issues? Well, I wanted to look at the ways students responded to different teachers, particularly focusing on whether very strict teachers made teenagers less motivated. And from your research, did you find that was true? No, not from what I saw, you know, from my five days observation, talking to people and so forth. OK. We'll talk about the actual research methods in a moment, but before that, can you briefly summarise what your most striking findings are? Well, what really amazed me was the significant gender differences. I didn't set out to focus on that, but I found that boys were much more positive about being at school. Girls were more impatient. They talked a lot about wanting to grow up and leave school. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. From doing the research, it was clear to me that you might start out to focus on one thing, but you pick up lots of unexpected insights. Right. Did you get any insights into teaching? Yes, certainly. I was doing a lot of observations of the way kids with very different abilities collaborate on certain tasks, you know, help each other. And I began to realise that the lessons were developing in really unexpected ways. So what conclusion do you draw from that? Well, I know it's necessary for teachers to prepare lessons carefully, but it's great if they also allow lessons to go their own ways. Good point. Now, I'm really pleased to see you doing this. Analyzing and drawing conclusions based on data. But surely this isn't proper data. Because it's derived from such small-scale research. Well, 
As long as you don't make grand claims for your findings, this data is entirely valid.、Mm. I like the way you're already stepping back from the experience and thinking about what you've learned about research. Well done. But I know I could have done it better. As you become more experienced, you'll find ways to reduce the risk of difficulties. Okay. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. So, let's look in more detail at how you gathered your data. Let's start with lesson observation. Well, it generally went quite smoothly. I chose my focus and designed my checklist. Then teachers allowed me into their classes without any problems, which surprised me. It was afterwards that the grueling work started. Yeah, it's very time-consuming, isn't it? Making sense of analyzing your observation notes. Absolutely, much more so than interview data, for example. That was relatively easy to process, though I wanted to make sure I used a high-quality recorder to make transcription easier, and I had to wait until one became available. Right, and did you interview some kids as well? In the end, yes, I talked to ten, and they were great. I'd imagined I'd be bored listening to them, but so it was easy to concentrate. Sure, one of the teachers was a bit worried about the ethics, you know, whether it was right to interview young pupils, and it took a while for him to agree to let me talk to three of the kids in his class, but he relented in the end. Good. What other methods did you use? I experimented with questionnaires, but I really regret that now. I decided to share the work with another student, but we had such different agendas; it ended up taking twice as long. That's a shame. It might be worth you reflecting on ways you might improve on that for future projects. You're right. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing I did was stills photography. I didn't take as many pictures as I'd hoped to. Lack of time. It's pretty easy just snapping away, but I wanted each snap to have a purpose, you know, that would contribute to my research aims, and I found that difficult. Well, that's understandable, but remember. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Here you'll hear a conversation at the counselling service. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, sit down, please. Thank you. Well, I heard about your counselling service from a friend, and I was really interested. You know, I'm a new student, and I don't know how you work. And well, the primary task of our service is to enable you to become more effective in your life, inside and outside the university. I think counselling is valuable if you're feeling that your life has become out of balance in some particular way. For example, it may be that you're experiencing difficulty in managing change, stress, or burnout, difficulty with concentration, depression, or anxiety, 
or a recent crisis of some kind, it can really help to talk things over with a counsellor. I see. After the semester began, I found I was facing tons of decisions that would be made by myself. I felt under stress sometimes. Yes, most new students have problems like yours. Just as I have said, it's a kind of being out of balance. Much of what we do is to help you get your thinking, feeling, behaviour, or perspective on life back into balance. We'll seek to help you focus on and understand more clearly the issues that concern you. But the issues are complex. I think they are about academic, personal, and many other aspects. I don't know how you can help me to decide so many. Well, we don't decide. We just help. We'll respect your own values, choices, and lifestyle. We work towards highlighting your strengths and inner resources to help you make the choices, resolutions, or changes that are right for you. When you're feeling under pressure, it's easy to lose sight of the many strengths and inner resources that you have. You mean I have enough strength to solve the problems and make choices? That's absolutely right. You just lose sight of them sometimes, and it can also be helpful to talk through any difficult decisions or dilemmas with which you may be faced. You don't have to wait until you're in a crisis to come and seek help. Taking the time and space to reflect in the supportive, private, and comfortable environment that the counselling service offers you is an effective way of to move forward positively in your life.、Hmm. Is it possible if I prefer a separate waiting area? Yes, we'll take account of any special requests you may have to protect your confidentiality. The record of your name and other basic information is kept for statistical purposes. Any notes written down about you are identified by a number. No personal information is kept on the computer. How do I know what particular counselling I need to balance myself? Well, as you've noticed, when you approach the service for counselling, you will be offered an initial half-hour assessment interview with one of the counsellors. They can answer any questions you may have. And help you to assess whether individual counselling is the best way forward for you. It is the initial assessment interview. If it is thought appropriate, a referral can be made to a variety of medical, therapeutic, or psychiatric services in the community. Or we can just begin weekly counselling sessions. How do I make an appointment if I need regular counselling? If you decide to proceed with regular counselling. You will be offered the first available appointment, often with a different counsellor. Each session would be for fifty minutes, and usually you would meet with your counsellor once a week. The average number of sessions that we see people is five, but that can be extended. You can decide on your preferred time: early morning or late afternoon.、Mm, it sounds pretty useful. I hope I can adapt to the new life with your help. You certainly will. Actually, going away to university is a time of transition and personal development. Evidence suggests that the vast majority of students who have been for counselling do find it a valuable experience. That is the end of part four.